I bought a sway. Certified everywhere. Ain't got a print resume. Hey, yo. Talk crazy. I pull up on the lane. RP the Nate, dog. I had to regulate. <laughs> Yay. Hi guys, today I want to talk to you about how to make a transgenic mouse. Now scientists have often used other organisms to explore more complex mechanisms in human beings. They generally start off with single-celled organisms like bacteria and yeast and then work their way up to animal models. Of the animal models, the mouse is probably the most popular. And there's some reasons for that. The mouse is small. The mouse is very well studied. We know a lot about their anatomy and physiology, and they're really good at picking up genetic information. With that being said, how do you create a transgenic mouse? Well, you've got two options. The first option is to micro-inject DNA directly into an embryo. And the second is to use homologous recombination for the uptake of the DNA. So, how do we create one? Method number one. Your first method for creating a transgenic mouse is going to be micro-injecting DNA directly into a fertilized egg. You will take eggs that have been fertilized before the male and female pronuclei have fused. It sounds complicated, but basically what you're trying to get is the eggs before the genetic information from mama and daddy have met. While that genetic information is separate, you're going to add your DNA into the male pronuclei. Now this is done using micro-injection, which essentially is like using a super, super tiny needle to go into an egg and inject DNA straight into the egg itself. Basically, you're just gonna shove a whole bunch of copies of the gene that you want to ultimately be expressed so that when it fuses with the female or nuclei and started to divide and, and, and create what will become the embryo of a new mouse. You will take those eggs that you micro-injected and place them back into the surrogate mouse. Once the litter is born, it'll be hard to tell which ones actually include the gene that you're looking for, even though you put the DNA there. So a simple genotyping test is done. You take a little bit of the tail and you send that off for genetic sequencing, which will confirm whether or not your gene was in the mouse's genome or not. You isolate the mice that have your gene, and at that point, you can then mate them with the wild type mouse or the normal mouse to ensure you have a stable genetic line. Now, there are some limitations to this. Basically, when you're taking several copies of your gene and just shooting them into the pronuclei of the embryo, you have no idea where it's going. You could end up with a genetic strand that has multiple copies of that same gene and take the chance that your DNA will be incorporated somewhere. Secondly, scientists use a method called homologous recombination to replace a normal gene. This simply means we're gonna take our normal gene and replace it with our mutant gene. Now, this process relies heavily on something that the cell will do naturally. Now, when a cell divides, it's gotta divide its nucleic material as well. And during this phase, meiosis, um, homologous chromosomes or similar pro chromosomes will line up and sometimes will cross over or trade DNA. This is the same process that we're going to rely on to get our mutant DNA into our normal cell. Now there's two ways that we can take our mutant gene and get it into our target genome. Now the first way would be taking our mutant gene and adding flanking sequences on either side. Now these flanking sequences are going to act as a transfer zone when it comes time to pop in our sequence and kick out the normal sequence. When we do this, we like to call that a knockout. Now we've knocked out that normal gene and replaced it with our mutant gene. We subsequently call our animal model a knockout mouse. Now the second method is by taking our gene and inserting it into the normal genome in an area that would have no effect on the mouse whatsoever. So you end up with both the normal gene and the mutant gene, but the mutant gene expression outweighs the expression of the normal gene. Everything we did before was prep work. Now it's time to breed the mice. Now because we can't see DNA, we have to use the phenotypes of the mouse or the physical characteristics in order to determine what's going on genetically. So we'll start with a pair of brown mice and we'll take those fertilized blastocytes 
which are essentially structures that hold a mass of cells that will then become an embryo, we'll take those blastocysts and culture them so we'll have colonies of embryonic stem cells. Now these embryonic stem cells are going to be the vehicle for our transgene. In order to get our transgene into the cell, we're going to need a little help. So we're going to use a method called electrophilation, which is essentially giving the cells a tiny shock, which opens up pores in the cell and allows the DNA to go through the cell membrane. Now we don't send genes into the cell just randomly, we lose them. Now we use certain genetic markers so that we can find our genes later. This could be anything from a certain protein expression or possibly uh, antibiotic resistance. The cells that possess our transgene will be plated individually to build their own colonies. With our new transgene colonies, we'll use molecular techniques such as PCR and southern blotting to ensure that we only have cells who have not undergone homologous transfer. Now we need more mice. This time we're going to take two albino mice, which will be completely white, take the blastocytes from them to our brown mouse stem cells, then implant those blastocytes back into a foster mother. And when those blastocytes gestate to become baby mice and grow up, we should have mice that have brown and white spots. The peculiar thing about these mice is that they have two genetic codes and how can we tell? Because the brown cells will coincide with the brown spots on that mouse, whereas the white genes will coincide with the white spots on that mouse. Now, this process happens totally at random. Brown spots and brown genes and white spots and white genes can end up anywhere on the mouse. Now, we call these types of mice chimera. They're literally two genetic codes put together to make one organism. This is all fine and well, but it doesn't mean anything if we can't continue to breed them. So we need to find a mouse whose germ cells, or special cells that you and baby mice, are, in fact, our transgenic cells. So we'll then take our chimeric mouse and then breed them back to with another albino mouse. Any resulting offspring that are completely brown, we then know our transgenic mice. Now I know I've explained this process quickly, but in the lab, it can take two years to get a stable genetic line of mice going. That being said, once you have them, you can do all sorts of wonderful tests for genetic diseases and disorders. All in all, we're better off for them, and you should thank the little guys next time you see them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mousy. You're welcome. Until next time. I'll see you in these science streets. Yeah.